the chronic mountain sickness syndrome involves uh, living, of course, above 2,500 meters, uh, having an excessive erythrocytosis. So we will see which level of hemoglobin concentration means uh, excessive erythrocytosis plus symptoms. So here you have the levels of hemoglobin concentration uh, considered as um, abnormal and healthy in Highlanders, so above 21 gram per deciliter for males and 99 gram, gram per deciliter for females, so clearly excessively high hemoglobin concentrations. And chronic mountain sickness is this uh, presence of excessive erythrocytosis plus some symptoms that you have uh, that you where you can that you can see here on this slide from breathlessness to uh, uh, headache so quite common um, symptoms at high altitude plus other uh, symptoms more specific to the this chronic mountain sickness syndrome and based on this classification uh, a total score can be calculated leading to a diagnosis of CMS, chronic mountain sickness, more or less severe. Interestingly, when looking at the prevalence of chronic mountain sickness around the wo world in the main regions of high altitude, you can see on this map that the prevalence of CMS is a lot lower in the Himalaya region and also in Africa compared to South America where the prevalence of chronic mountain sickness can reach up to 10, 20% in some regions, especially in Peru and Bolivia. So when considering the highest permanent human habitation around the world, and also when considering what is the maximum altitude that humans may tolerate, uh, we can show, we can see in some um, previous publications that uh, town, a city in Peru uh, called La Rinconada might be apparently is the highest city in the world. At least this is what we knew from this paper for some, some years ago. And we knew that this city in La Rinconada was pretty big, probably above 5,000 5, meters with uh, very low uh, inspiratory oxygen partial pressure and consequently probably very low arterial oxygen pressure. But in fact, we had very, very few information on this uh, city of La Rinconada. Interestingly, also when uh, considering, when thinking about the, uh, p the oxygen pressure, either in the inspired hair or at the level of the alveoli and in the arterial blood, it's interesting to see that there is, of course, a progressive reduction in this uh, arterial oxygenation pressure when when climbing to high altitude. And at very high altitude in these uh, cities in Peru, for instance, Cerro de Pasco and this city of La Rinconada, it is um, uh, interesting, quite fascinating to see that the uh, arterial partial pressure is probably below the thresholds used for um, oxygen therapy, so for used for prescribing oxygen to respiratory patients. So in this city, there are probably many, many people, maybe the whole population, living with PaO2 below what is used as a threshold to prescribe oxygen in our countries. So, um, because we knew very few uh, things about this city of La Rinconada and about this population of La Rinconada, we, uh, we had some contact and we were able to uh, meet the people of La Rinconada thanks to Dr. Ivan Anko, um, a medical doctor from Peru who was uh, uh, providing some care to this population for many years. And thanks to him, we had the opportunity to uh, tr to travel first and then to prepare a specific project in the city of La Rinconada. Uh, we were able to visit this city and first to confirm that it is a very big city with more than 50,000 inhabitants um, organized around a gold mine with several uh, gold uh, mine facilities. And indeed, this city is above 5,000 meters, um, between 5,100 and 5,300 meters, really the highest city in the world. And you can have um, uh, more information on this uh, science article dealing with uh, our project in, in this hypoxia city. 
So we developed this first medical and scientific program in Arin Canada in 2019 first in this uh, in this highest city in the world and we we named this uh, project expedition 5300 and since then since 2019 we um, organized several missions several scientific and medical missions in this city of Larin Canada here i should be able to show you some um, at least a small video from the city. I'm not sure you had some uh, or you had the music, <laughs> you have the music uh, going together with the video, but uh, and sorry also for the French subtitles, but at least you have some uh, pictures and some ideas about um, this city and the kind of work we can do in terms of science or, med of, or medicine. And it tells you in few words that we have uh, research project ongoing in the city, but also some projects regarding um, medical center because uh, most of these uh, inhabitants have no real um, medical care. No hospital, etc. in this uh, in this city. OK, so um, now that you have more um, a better feeling of what is Laring Canada, uh, on the scientific side, uh, these are the main objectives that we are still um, uh, working on. Um, of course, we were interested in the effect of chronic hypoxic exposure on this population. So quite severe chronic hypoxic exposure because at this altitude, the inspiratory oxygen pressure is about 50% only of the sea level inspiratory oxygen pressure. So we are interested in um, investigating the uh, adaptations uh, developed by this population, but also the health issues encountered by this population. We have heard already about excessive erythrocytosis, chronic mountain sickness, and another maladaptation is pulmonary arterial hypertension. So we uh, first had the opportunity to collect um, clinical de data from uh, Dr. Ivan Hanko um, medical activities, and we had some um, overall characteristics of almost um, 1,500 people living in Laring, Canada, showing especially the prevalence of excessive erythrocytosis in this population, and about half of the population have a uh, hemoglobin concentration higher than the definition of excessive erythrocytosis. So clearly a large part of the population have very, very large, very 
uh, important, very severe uh, excess erythrocytosis. And chronic mountain sickness also was observed in this subpopulation in about 15% of this population. Uh, interestingly, also you can see that the uh, outer oxygen saturation in this population is about 80%. So these people are living um, 24 hours a day for their whole day, for their whole life, with an S SpO2 of about 80%. We also had the opportunity to have a longitudinal, longitudinal uh, study on 90 male Highlanders living permanently in Laring, Canada. Uh, about 30 years old, and we could have some clinical data from them um, during 14 years. Um, here you can see over these 14 years the uh, progressive reduction of their arterial oxygen saturation, the, their progressive increase in hematocrit, and also the progressive increase in clinical chronic mountain sickness score. And so we could show the progressive increase also during these 14 years of the excessive er erythrocytosis incidence and CMS incidence also. And finally, we were able to demonstrate that the number of years spent in Larin Canada, as well as the uh, outer oxygen saturation, are independent factor explaining the increase in hematocrit and CMS score. So these were data from um, a general clinical follow-up of uh, a sub subsample of this population. But then we were able to perform more um, physiological uh, investigations and we compared hematological and cardiovascular characteristics of lowlanders living in Lima, of highlanders living in a city quite lower than Laring Conada at about uh, 3,800 meters, so both without CMS. And we were also able to compare these two populations to Highlanders in Laring Conada without or with uh, mild or moderate severe chronic mountain sickness. So we overall we investigated the effect of altitude in LCP poles, so comparing uh, individuals without CMS at uh, sea level in on the Altiplano in Puno and in Laring Canada, and comparing the effect of having or not chronic mountain sickness in the population of Laring Canada. Here you can see the main characteristics of these different subgroups. Uh, especially, you can see that, uh, as I said before, in Laring Canada, the uh, outer oxygen saturation is about 80-85%. As you can see also from a normal hemoglobin concentration at sea level in Peru, already on the Altiplano, the hemoglobin concentration in the general population is uh, clearly increased almost 19 gram, gram per deciliter. And you have this huge hemoglobin concentration up to 24, and these are average value, 24 gram per deciliter in the sick uh, highlanders in Laring Canada. So this corresponds to an hematocrit of 75% uh, in Laring Canada compared to the well-known 40-45% uh, we have all at sea level. So what are the main differences, main characteristics of these different uh, subgroups? First, we were interested in measuring total hemoglobin mass and intravascular volumes by using the carbon monoxide rebreathing technique that some of you may know, also applied in athletes, for instance. And based on these uh, measurements, we had uh, the total hemoglobin mass in lowlanders Highlanders living permanently at 3,800 meters and in the Highlanders from Laring Canada. As you can see from about normal value of 7,800 grams uh, of hemoglobin at sea level, this value is progressively increased slightly already on the Altiplano, close to 4,000 meters, but uh, extremely uh, increased at the altitude of Laring Conada, up to more than two kilos of hemoglobin. Um, I would say, just to give you an idea, that in athletes at sea level, after altitude training, 
you might expect some values slightly higher than one kilo, but here you have uh, Highlanders living permanently with more than two kilos of hemoglobin in Larinconada. So really, uh, in fact, probably the highest value ever measured in, in humans in terms of hemoglobin mass in these Highlanders from Larinconada, both in those without and those with chronic mountain sickness. And uh, regarding the intravascular volumes also measured with this technique, um, you can see that the uh, permanent residence at high altitude is accompanied by a progressive reduction in plasma volume, maybe slightly more important in uh, Highlanders in Larin, Canada with chronic mountain sickness. And also the total blood volume as a consequence is uh, progressively increased. I mean, as a consequence of the increase in total hemoglobin mass, again, to relatively extreme values above 8, 10 liters in Larin, Canada of blood compared to our five liters of blood at sea level. So clearly there are impressive changes in total hemoglobin mass and intravascular volumes in these um, dwellers from the highest city in the world in Larin, Canada. And of course, one of the questions um, when looking at these values are how much this blood uh, is viscous. Uh, what is the blood viscosity in these Highlanders with 70-80% hematocrit? So this is the next um, uh, aspect we investigated in, in Larin Conada, so measuring blood viscosity and its determinant by using specific devices, especially a viscometer, complete viscometer. And so we could measure viscosity, whole blood viscosity at different shear rates and also at native or corrected hematocrit. Here are the main results. On the left panel, you can see the blood viscosity between lowlanders, highlanders uh, on the Altiplano and healthy islanders in Larin, Canada. So only the effect of altitude with clear increase in blood viscosity depending on the altitude of residence, reaching very high level of blood viscosity in Larin, Canada. And on the right panel, you have the effect of having or not chronic mountain sickness in Larin, Canada, with again a slight additional increase in blood viscosity in the sickest uh, highlanders or in, in, in the highlanders with the most severe chronic mountain sickness in Larin, Canada compared to the healthy uh, dwellers from Larin, Canada. So clearly these um, highlanders have excessively high uh, blood viscosity and this is true at native hematocrit but interestingly also when uh, standardizing, when correcting the hematocrit up to a normal value of 40%, the Highlanders with, with chronic mountain sickness still have an increased blood viscosity, so which might suggest some um, other specificities than the high hematocrit, maybe some um, part specificities in red blood cell deformability, for example, and these are information um, parameters that we are currently analyzing in terms of red blood cell aggregation deformability that may contribute to this very high viscosity. Also, an uh, additional question that we are uh, issue that we are dealing with is whether the coagulation process and the risk of thrombosis especially is higher in these uh, extreme highlanders. All these uh, studies are ongoing and we should be able uh, soon to share the, the main results. Of course, the next uh, question when when considering this uh, large amount of blood, large amount of hemoglobin mass and also very high blood viscosity, the, the question arising is whether how these Highlanders can deal with these uh, hematological constraint, especially in terms of uh, cardiovascular function. Here you have the um, results of a 24 hour blood pressure monitoring. Uh, performed in subjects as, at sea level on the Altiplano and uh, in Highlanders, all healthy people. So here you have the effect of altitude with very small changes in uh, systemic blood pressure, both uh, systolic and diastolic, as you can see. So all together in, in Larin, Canada, in healthy people, systemic blood pressure is pretty normal. 
And interestingly, even in uh, Highlanders with chronic mountain sickness in Laring, Canada, the systemic blood pressure, systolic, diastolic is are within the normal ranges, slightly increased compared to LC dwellers from Laring, Canada. But still, you can see that the values are not uh, very high from what we could expect based on these huge hematological changes that I showed you before. Also, we didn't find uh, we didn't find any changes in pulse wave velocity or carotidine tima media thickness, so no major changes in the main uh, arteries, systemic arteries. Still, we have some um, data under analysis, especially regarding uh, vascular reactivity and cerebrovascular reactivity also. I can show you some results from, from um, papers currently under review. In few words, we used um, different stress to measure vascular reactivity, so um, ischemic, so flow-mediated dilation. Uh, also, for at the macrovascular level, we, we measured uh, heat responses in terms of macrovascular reactivity. And we could show that overall, when considering the effect of altitude of residents, the resi residents at, of, at high altitude is inducing clearly a reduction in both microvascular and macrovascular reactivity. Probably due to a large um, dilation already observed under resting conditions, so with few room for to, to further vasodilate in response to ischemia or heat. When considering now the effect of having or not chronic mountain sickness in, in Laring Canada, we showed, we observed some, some additional reduction in uh, vascular reactivity, especially at the macrovascular level with lower values in, in CMS compared to non-CMS Highlanders. So clearly, the, the vascular reactivity is affected by both the, the residents at high altitude and uh, uh, by the fact of having a chronic mountain sickness syndrome. At the brain level, also in few words, and sorry for this uh, pretty buzzy slide, uh, we could show that at the cerebrovascular level, there, there is a reduced cerebral blood flow velocity, uh, but still a maintained oxygen delivery at the cerebral level. And we also studied uh, the orthostatic tolerance at the brain level in these highlanders with pretty preserved um, status responses despite this severe uh, chronic hypoxic exposure. All, in addition, of course, to the, the vascular uh, level, we all were also interested in knowing whether these highlanders showed cardiac remodeling and uh, changes in at the pulmonary circulation level. Here I will show you the main results regarding the right heart and here the effect of altitude. So comparing lowlanders, highlanders in the Altiplano and again uh, highlanders in Laring, Canada. So based on these different parameters overall, um, we observed that there, were, that there was clearly a, a large right heart dilation in the people from Laring, Canada compared to lowlanders, a concentric remodeling, a clear increase in pulmonary artery pressure, and some impairment in ventricle uh, systolic function. When considering now only dwellers from Laring, Canada without or with chronic mountain sickness, we observed a further right heart dilation in these sick people from Laring, Canada, still some concentric remodeling, but not higher than in the healthy dwellers from Laring, Canada. Also, pulmonary artery pressure was not increased further in CMS subject from Laring, Canada. And uh, also similar to healthy people in Laring, Canada, we observed, we observed some uh, systolic dysfunction. So when considering the previous reports of pulmonary arterial pressure at uh, in Highlanders, so from sea level to different uh, high altitude locations, we were able to show in this highest city in the world, in Laurelin, Canada, the highest, probably the highest average pulmonary arterial pressure in these Highlanders at more than 5,000 meters of altitude. We were also interested in knowing how the pulmonary hemod hemodynamic 
um, is modified during exercise depending on the altitude of residence. So from uh, sea level, black uh, bars to the white bars in Laring, Canada, and also to know how much CMS subjects were affected in terms of pulmonary hemodynamic during exercise. So in a few words, we observed clearly higher pulmonary arterial pressure during exercise in Laring, Canada compared to lower altitude and sea level. And we also observed in CMS um, inhabitants in Laring, Canada, larger increase in pulmonary arterial pressure during exercise. So clearly exercise is a um, difficult uh, situation for these people, especially in terms of uh, pulmonary hemodynamic. We were also uh, interested in addition to exercise in a specific uh, condition when staying at altitude. We, we know that for athletes sleeping under hypoxic conditions, we know that sleep is uh, quite modified during hypoxic exposure. And we wanted to know whether these islanders from Laring, Canada, permanently exposed to severe hypoxia, had some changes in sleep uh, breathing, especially in terms of uh, periodic breathing, apnea, hypopnea index. And interestingly, we didn't observe higher ap apnea, hypopnea index in terms of central events in these people from Laring, Canada compared to lowlanders. But still, we observed um, uh, oxygen desaturation index, so some uh, oscillation in SpO2 in these islanders, especially those with chronic mountain sickness compared to lowlanders. So oscillation, nocturnal oscillation in arterial oxygenation. So still suggesting some uh, breathing impairment during sleep. And as you can see here, we also observe very low a nocturnal SpO2, especially in the sickest patients in, in Laring, Canada, as you can see with mean values around 75% during sleep in these uh, people from Laring, Canada with chronic mountain sickness. So this suggests that uh, sleep is probably uh, um, an important period of the day to tolerate or to develop intolerance to hypoxia when permanently residing residing in uh, at high altitude. And um, to finish with our main results, uh, we also conducted a randomized randomized control trial in Laring, Canada, in order to de to determine whether some pharmacological treatment might help Highlanders with chronic mountain sickness in Laring, Canada. So we randomized 60 Highlanders with chronic mountain sickness to three groups, uh, either placebo and acetazolamide group or an atorvastatin uh, group. And we were able, at least after three weeks of treatment, to reassess the health status of these um, Highlanders with chronic mountain sickness to determine whether these treatments may help them to better tolerate high altitude exposure. And again, in a few words, you, you, you can have access to the to the original paper, but we showed, especially with acetazolamide, that after three weeks of treatment, arterial oxygenation was improved and interestingly, hematocrit was reduced, uh, probably because of a better uh, arterial oxygenation, also probably because of an increased, slight increase in plasma volume. And uh, this such reduction in hematocrit of 5% might probably um, induce some improvement in symptoms in these patients with, with chronic mountain sickness. Again, reducing hematocrit for them is uh, probably a key mechanism to reduce the symptoms associated with uh, chronic mountain sickness and very, very high hematocrit up to 70, 80% as I, as I showed you before. So to conclude, um, regarding the projects that we are currently running in Laring, Canada, and also our perspectives, uh, I just showed you some, some first results regarding treatment of chronic mountain sickness, but clearly future studies are required to better define the kind of treatment, the kind of management we can propose to these highlanders with chronic mountain sickness and quite severe impairment while living at such very high altitude. Women and children health are also specific issues that we have to deal with at high altitude. We are currently running a specific project on children. In children dealing with anemia and iron deficiency 
up to so in in children living 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 to high altitude up to La Rue in Canada. We have also several um, homics approach ongoing to better describe the phenotypes of these highlanders living, uh, especially in La Rue in Canada and more perspectives also dealing with our definition of chronic mountain sickness, which uh, probably need to be updated. And as I, as I, as I showed you in the, in the movie, we have also a project of a high altitude medical and research center in, in this highest city in the world in La Rue, Canada, that could, uh, that could both, both help the local dwellers and also help our community to better uh, investigate the uh, hypoxic responses at this very high altitude. I would like to thank all the collaborators, all the labs, uh, French and foreigners involved in this project and also thank you for your for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, very exciting uh, presentation. Seems like uh, very impressive to do all that work at 5,300 meters in a different culture. So um, well done to the team. Um, feel free to ask uh, some questions in the chat. So we know we have uh, 15 minutes for um, questions. So do not hesitate to ask uh, anything you would like to know for your next uh, holidays in Larinka. <laughs> yeah, I have a first question coming in. What about hemat hematological or other parameters in people from La Rinconada who lived lower elsewhere, for, for instance, at sea level? Um, so other hematological uh, parameters. So as I said, uh, well, first we described the uh, HB mass intravascular volumes, but I think you 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 show the you saw the the data. As I said, we are um, uh, f completing uh, investigations about the um, the risk of thrombosis and the coagulation process of these people, and the the, the latest results show that um, despite this very very high hematocrit, these these people are have uh, quite a preserved uh, coagulation process, quite hypocoagulation co uh, status, probably to compensate for the very high hematocrit. So these are the additional data we have. We also investigated the iron status of these people because to produce such a high amount of hemoglobin and with um, a local diet that might um, uh, miss some sufficient iron content. We were wondering whether these people could have some iron deficiency. But again, based on the, the, the full iron hemostasis investigation we performed, uh, we could observe that they are, these islanders are managing pretty well their iron status and we couldn't um, diagnose uh, high prevalence of iron deficiency, for instance. So uh, these are the other uh, hematological parameters that I can uh, give you. OK, thank you. Um, while waiting for other questions to come in, I'm wondering, um, since it's a foreign culture, pe people might not be so used to um, research, how willing are the people from Latin Canada to participate in the studies? Yeah, that's a very good question and very important question for us because uh, um, it's not the same story to perform um, research in athletes, in uh, people living in our uh, countries, European or, or North America countries, aware of what is research. It's not the same of doing research in our countries and in such uh, a low income country with uh, very remote um cities having no access to any health resources etc so indeed we have to explain quite precisely what we are doing who we are in fact we are the, the only white people in the city so uh, we have every time we go there we have to explain our objectives we have to share our project with the local population we also try to provide some um, 
uh, help equipment to the population in addition to perform research and we try also to provide the first results and especially the first um, applications for them to the population. So overall, we are pretty welcome in this city, but it's true that it's a very specific environment to, condu to conduct uh, clinical or clinical research. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you very much. I'll see if there are other questions coming in. Um, I saw that you did a longitudinal study for over 14 years. How did you manage to follow up that many people for uh, that long period of time? Yes, good, good question too. Uh, in fact, as I said, we had a uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Ivanenko, uh, so this um, Peruvian medical doctor. Uh, he originates from the Altiplano, so lower at lower altitude than La Rinconada, but over more than 15 years, he provided some care, health care to the population a day or two every month. And so he collected clinical data over many, many years, more than 15 years. He collected uh, these clinical data and as he performed a PhD within our lab in France, we were able to uh, analyzed this set of data that he collected over his uh, clinical activity and that's how we could have access to the uh, really uh, original longitudinal data from from highlanders in Lorraine Canada. Okay that's really interesting. I have another question in the chat that's expanding on the first one um, who's asking did you control for and look at differences if individuals were born there or if they were born lower and moved later in life to Latin Canada? That's also a very good question because um, babies are, 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 or people are, are born, really born in, were born in, in Latin Canada, but others also are just traveling or traveled at some point from lower altitudes so originating from the Altiplano around 4,000 meters of altitude. Um, they are, there is very, very few or almost known people living in La Rinconada Canada originating from sea level. This would be probably very, very difficult. So they are all highlanders, but not all are originating from La Rinconada. Canada. Some of them moved from 4000 meters to uh, La Rinconada, Canada, especially for economical reason. And this is one of the, um, the parameter that we are um, dealing with in terms of population heterogeneity, uh, but also it is an, an interesting um, approach to see how much genetic or epigenetic factors might influence um, adaptations to life at this extreme altitude. So I, I can't say uh, at, this, uh, at this stage uh, what are the, the real differences between people born in Larin Canada and others born at 4000 meters. But clearly this might be a, a difference both in terms of adaptations and maladaptations since as we are currently studying children um, staying, going at school in Larin Canada, we, we can see that staying as a child in Larin Canada um, in, imposes quite big uh, constraint in terms of hematological cardiovascular responses. So uh, of course uh, these children might develop some very specific adaptations but also they might develop quite early during their life some signs of uh, hypoxia intolerance. So again uh, I cannot answer whether being born or not in La Rinconada Canada make a big difference uh, in terms of adaptations, but it, it might play a role for sure. Thank you for the for the question. OK, thank you. Someone else is wondering if you collected any data about kidney health uh, and the hydration status. Yes, that's also a very important point. Uh, we didn't yet um, study this aspect, but uh, especially when looking at um, some changes in plasma volume in people with chronic mountain sickness, so in all highlanders in Larin Conola, but even more specifically in those with chronic mountain sickness, we are indeed interested in, in kidney function to know how this 
might be affected by uh, permanent hypoxic uh, exposure. So again, a very important uh, perspective within our research program. Okay, then we have a, a next question coming in asking about IDs, about how different people react to altitude and then in particular, why some people develop chronic mountain sickness and others tolerate high altitude better. Um, why is there this variability and how can you study it? Yes, well, this is uh, the, the the big question, the big uh, the big um, issue we are uh, investigating since, in fact, the very beginning. Um, and that's not only true in Labyrinth Canada, but knowing why um, some of us, why some athletes will tolerate uh, hypoxic exposure very well at high altitude and others won't and why others might even uh, become sick uh, during altitude exposure. This is the, the, the big issue in our field of research. And uh, of course, uh, for example, at the genetic level in these uh, native population, they are probably factors explaining uh, the, the fact that probably Himalayan population and uh, Andean populations have, uh, as I showed, very different prevalence in uh, chronic mountain sickness. So there are clearly probably some genetic adaptations more positive or preventing the population from, from, from Himalaya, for example, to develop chronic mountain sickness, while in the Andes, the responses, especially the large increase in hemolumin concentration, expose them to um, chronic mountain sickness to, to, a, to a greater level. So uh, for sure, there are genetic differences, but at the within the population of, uh, of the Andes in, in South America, we still have to clearly determine why some and not others have, are developing intolerance to, to permanent high altitude uh, exposure. This is again a central case question in the field. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, I have another question um, about if you monitored iron levels uh, in these people. So yes, we did. We, we published data on this, uh, as I said before. And uh, again, at least in male adults, uh, we were quite um, impressed by the fact that despite their the diet, which is again probably quite uh, low in terms of iron um, intake, despite this and despite their, their needs in terms of iron for the large hemoglobin mass, these male adults have a pretty preserved iron uh, status and metabolism. But again, we, we have no data in females, we have no data, or we are collecting data in children. So uh, for the moment, I can only tell you that apparently in male adults, iron deficiency is not prevalent in Lauren Conola, but we still we are still missing data in females and uh, in children also. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Another interesting question coming up um, about people and their lives there if are people also exercising there like we do football aside of their mining activity and if yes is it risky or is it more helpful for them yes good good question about the the, the everyday life in La Canada so um on in the back at the back of this picture you can see the mines where they are working and uh, you can see this guy traveling uh, with some heavy uh, packages um, of course, doing sport is not the main uh, the main motivation for them. In addition to this uh, difficult work and difficult these difficult uh, conditions, but still in the city uh, there are uh, football pitches um, where we can see that um, some some miners, also children at school, are playing football, um, volley, etc., volleyball. So clearly, uh, some of them are, are able to do some sport um, better than us. We try to play with them and clearly uh, we can run a lot less than them at this altitude. Whether it is dangerous, apparently not. Uh, the, I don't think they would uh, continue whether they would uh, feel sick after a small football match. So uh, clearly that they, they have uh, physical, uh, still uh, f exercise physical capacities, allowing them to do some 
exercise sport there. But on the other hand, we also show that uh, when performing exercise testing, exercise testing with vehicle cardiography, uh, their ability to tolerate intense exercise is quite reduced, uh, probably due to the large amount of blood and the uh, high blood viscosity and also uh, due to the probably the, the the inability to dilate their vessels since they are already vasodilated at rest their the room for further vasodilation is probably reduced during exercise so clearly they can do some exercise some sport they do it but we still have to explore their maximum exercise capacity to see how much they can preserve this maximal exercise capacity with the large hematological cardiovascular responses I showed you. Okay, interesting. Um, then another question coming in. Um, so you talked about the clinical implications for the people actually living there, but um, can your data also offer other clinical implications that are not in the altitude field? Yes, thank you for, for this question. Also, of course, uh, our first motivation is to, to better um, describe the effect of permanent hypoxia in this population and to provide some, um, some help, some uh, medical management strategy um, to this population. This is clearly our first goal. But it's true that by studying the effect of chronic hypoxia in these islanders, we are also improving our knowledge of the effect of hypoxia in general in, in human beings. And so this may, might have some implications for, especially for respiratory diseases uh, in hypoxemic patients. And uh, of course, there, there is no, I, I can't say there are direct implications to, to respiratory uh, patients in our countries, but knowing how these highlanders can tolerate, can deal with severe hypoxemia is clearly um, an interesting way to better understand the effect and the potential response tolerance to hypoxemia in our respiratory patients. So uh, I would say it's increasing our knowledge of the effect of uh, hypoxia on, on humans and this, had, this can have some implication in the respiratory diseases. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we have covered all questions from the audience. Thank you very much for uh, posing your questions as well. Um, so from hypoxia, which was very interesting, we can go to heat now, which I think is becoming highly, highly relevant with the climate change coming up. So, uh, Danielle, you can share your... Ah, wait, <laughs> I'm going to introduce you first um, so people know who you are and who will be talking. So, uh, Professor Daniel Gagnon is a researcher at the Montreal Heart Institute, and he's also an associate professor at the School of Kinesiology and Exercise Science uh, of the University de Montréal in Canada. He's the director of the Human Integrative Physiology Laboratory there. His research program examines the physiological responses and adaptations to heat exposure and how they are affected by age and health status and the underlying physiological adaptations who are mediating the adverse and beneficial cardiovascular outcomes associated with heat exposure. I'm curious to learn more about your work on extreme heat and cardiovascular health. Thank you, Jeanne. Maybe just to make sure you can hear me and see my PowerPoint. Yes, perfect. OK, perfect. So thanks for the invitation. Thanks, everyone, for for uh, being online today. And thanks, uh, Sam Red, for a very interesting talk. So like Jen said, we're going to switch uh, gears a little bit, go from uh, the high mountains of, uh, of Peru to uh, talking about extreme heat and cardiovascular health. All right, so I'll start off with my take home messages, which at the same time serve as a little bit of an outline for the presentation. So hopefully by the end of the talk, um, you'll, you'll take home that climate change is everyone's business. So it's not the main focus of my presentation today, but I feel an obligation to, to discuss a little bit climate change and uh, its impact on, on everyone, essentially. And then I'll talk a little bit more specifically about how extreme heat is associated with greater cardiovascular risk. And then I'll, I'll present to you in more detail a study that we completed not long ago, um, which we were trying to understand how is extreme heat associated with greater cardiovascular risk. So 
I'm going to go over some classic data that shows that heat exposure requires substantial cardiovascular adjustments and that these adju adjustments cause an increase in myocardial blood flow. And that increase is, is important enough to predispose adults with coronary artery disease to myocardial ischemia. So first, let's uh, have a just a one moment to uh, discuss climate change. So as you probably all know by now, um, we're obviously living in an era of climate change. And this one way to look at this is to look at the graph here that was published by um, the last report from the IPCC in, in 2022 which shows global surface temperature change relative to the pre-industrial area. So that's uh, for reference 1850 to 1900s. So this is the change from that period. Uh, from 1950 to let's say 1990, you can see that it was relatively stable. So we, we were a little bit over the pre-industrial er era, but it didn't really change much. And then past the 1990s, up until present day, we can clearly see a trend for an upward uh, warming of the of uh, global surface temperatures. Um, so we uh, recently reached 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial eras. And obviously what's going to happen in the future is, is uh, still unknown. But the IPCC has made various projections that essentially go from a, a best case scenario, very optimistic scenario, to a worst case scenario or very pessimistic scenario. And depending on that, in the best case scenario, we can probably hope to stabilize global warming to about 1.5 degrees Celsius um, until, let's say, 2050. And in the worst case scenario, maybe it could go as high as 4 to 5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial era. And obviously, the problem with that is that it has many, many consequences. Today, we're going to talk about uh, extreme heat, but that's only one consequence associated with climate change. And the way that the IPCC represents this, it, it lists uh, what it calls RFCs or reasons for concerns. It's grouped into five categories. So we have uh, unique and threatened systems. So for example, think of coral, coral reefs, uh, glaciers, extreme weather events. So obviously extreme heat is, is a part of that, heat waves, uh, but it could also be droughts, fires, um, um, uh, things like that. Distribution of impacts. Uh, unfortunately, uh, like many things, the impacts of climate change are not distributed equally amongst all populations. So some pe people will suffer more than others. Uh, RFC4 speaks about global aggregate impacts. So those are really um, sociological or ecological events that can be combined into a single metric and are really on a global scale. So for one example is, for example, the extinction, extinction of species. And then RFC5 is, is large scale singular events. Uh, so things that are relatively abrupt and uh, potentially irreversible. So one example that they give is ice sheet disintegration. And the way the graph is set up here is the little dotted line is kind of separates what has happened. So what's been observed at the bottom versus what might come depending on the level of future climate or uh, global warming that we actually reach. So, and then the colors represent uh, different levels of risks or impacts. So white would be undetectable. There are no risks for these systems uh, related to climate change. Yellow is moderate, high is red, and then purple is very high. And what's important to remember is that if we enter the very high impact category, there's a potential for irreversibility. So maybe if we get to that point, it'll be too late to do something about it. So we can see there's already been some risks uh, moderate to high for certain categories. Um, and today I'm going to speak specifically about extreme weather events and even more specifically about extreme heat. Uh, but I just wanted to give you a bigger picture of, of the context that motivates our research. And hopefully this can, the point is not to, to scare us. And, and actually these, these scenarios assume no adaptation. So the good news is that if we adapt and, and do something about it, well, hopefully we can minimize the impact that climate change will have on our planet. So hopefully we can just take a moment to reflect on what we can do individually on a daily basis. So with that said, um, let's speak specifically of uh, climate change and human health. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail about this. Obviously, I'm going to focus on extreme heat. That's only one consequence uh, for health. Uh, there are many more. And if you're interested in, in these issues, I highly, highly recommend that you, can, that you consult the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change. Um, this was essentially set up after the uh, Paris Agreement in uh, 2015. And every year, the Lancet Countdown provides a report, which is 
published in the journal The Lancet, and they essentially track a whole bunch of indicators related to many, many impacts that climate change could have on human health. So if, if, you, if you're interested, I, I recommend that you consult um, the latest issue, which was published towards the end of last year. So if, if we focus specifically on, on temperatures and especially, especially extreme heat, um, we just need to recognize that extreme temperatures, whether it's hot as the, as the case we'll discuss today, or even cold, are associated with greater health risks. And I think that one of the better studies to exemplify this is, the, is a study that was published in The Lancet in 2015. And essentially what they did is they, um, they derive associations between temperature and uh, mortality. And what they did is they reviewed over 74 million uh, deaths that occurred in 384 cities across 13 countries. So it was a very comprehensive assessment. And essentially what they did is they plotted mortality rates across the, the, var the temperatures that occurred in, in, in that specific area or that specific city over the year. So I'll give you one example here for that's closer to me in Toronto and Canada. So we have the relative risk of mortality as a function of ambient temperature, so daily temperature. And we can see that um, as the temperatures get higher, on the right side, there's a slightly greater relative risk of mortality past a certain optimal temperature that, that they call, which is basically the temperature at, at which the mortality rate is lowest. And if there were no effect of temperatures, we would, ex we would expect here a flat line. But we can see that, at least here in Canada, maybe there's not that much of an effect for cold, but we can see that once temperatures enter a certain threshold, we can see a greater relative risk. But in general, we can see sort of a J-shape uh, relationship where we can see that with cold it kind of increases progressively as a function of a decrease in temperature but on the hot side the risk escalates quickly past a certain threshold and there are a few points to remember from from these data this relationship generally holds true no matter where you are on the planet so toronto canada beijing china sydney australia uh, in london in the uk um, obviously, the, the relative risks uh, change depending on where you are, and especially the optimal temperature changes as well. So, for example, for, for us in Canada and Toronto, the optimal temperature is maybe around 20 degrees Celsius. And once it goes, it goes above that, we can start seeing a slight increase in the risk of mortality, which may not seem that hot. Um, and we can see, for example, in Sydney and Australia, which is generally hotter, well, that threshold still occurs, but it'll occur at a, at a higher temperature. So in this case, about 25 degrees Celsius. And the last point that I think is important to remember is that when the relative risk does increase on the hot side, it does tend to increase quickly, so exponentially. Um, even though extreme heat days are maybe not numerous, they, there might not be that many in a year, well, if they are prolonged, it, it can lead to um, pretty important consequences. So we can think of, for example, the, the most striking ones, obviously the European summers of 2003, uh, where there was approximately 70,000 heat-related deaths that occurred during that summer, which was particularly hot. And even more recently, the, the European summer of 2022, uh, during which there was approximately 60,000 heat-related deaths that occur. So when extreme heat is prolonged, it can lead to a, a quick accumulation of, of deaths. So the, the next question is, okay, well, if there's this association between extreme heat or hot temperatures and mortality, what, what could cause this relationship? Well, one way to look at it is to consider the, the physiological responses to heat exposure. So when the human body is, is, is exposed to heat, and we can really separate this into three things. So we, we have the first one here is obviously we have an internal body temperature. It has to be maintained within a relatively narrow range. And if it increases too much because our heat loss ability is compromised or, or the, environment, uh, the environmental conditions exceed our ability to dissipate enough heat, well, obviously our internal, internal body temperature can increase to dangerous levels. And that can be associated with things like heat stroke, which is potentially deadly if it's not uh, recognized and treated immediately. So we'll put that over here. And we obviously during periods of hot weather or extreme heat events, cases of heat stroke or heat related injuries do increase. But 
perhaps surprisingly or counterintuitively, intuitively, those cases are not considered the main causes of death or even hospital admissions during periods of extreme heat. And the main causes are mostly related to the what I like to call the collateral physiological strain that occurs during heat exposure. So obviously the body, when it's hot, it tries to defend, defend itself and maintain body temperature, and it does this through two ways. The first one is it'll vasodilate the, the blood vessels in the skin to try and send as much uh, skin blood, uh, blood flow towards the skin to facilitate heat exchange between the body and the environment. Now that obviously helps for, for heat exchange, but the skin is a very uh, has a very big capacity to vasodilate, and it's also a very compliant vascular bed. So it it diminishes venous re return, and it'll cause an increase in uh, cardiovascular strain that's depicted here, but mostly an increase in heart rate and also an increase in cardiac contractility. Um, and it can, in if especially if we're in the upright position, it can also also decrease blood pressure. So overall, it kind of it causes an increase in cardiac strain. And on top of that, our main mechanism to dissipate heat is the evaporation of sweat. And if we sweat, but we don't replace it with uh, sufficient fluid intake, well, that can lead to fluid loss and subsequent dehydration. And actually, at least in the US, it's been shown that for older adults, uh, kidney related issues or uh, electrolyte imbalances are the main cause of hospital admissions um, during extreme uh, heat events. And obviously, if, if there's dehydration and decrease in, in blood volume, well, that can further compromise uh, uh, venous return and decrease stroke volume, and it'll exacerbate the cardiac strain that, that is already present anyways uh, when exposed to heat. So I always like to think about it as the physiological triad. So we have obviously thermal strain. If core temperature goes up too high, that can be bad for health. Um, but also the other responses, which are totally normal, uh, but that in some populations, like I'll, I'll show you a little bit later, can predispose to health issues. So cardiac strain and also dehydration that places strain on the kidneys and an additional strain on, on the cardiovascular system. So today I'm, I'm going to focus specifically on, on this aspect here, and we're going to focus a little bit more on what could be um, happening uh, to the cardiovascular system during heat exposure. So a few slides ago, I, I presented the relationship between extreme temperatures and mortality. Those were relationships for all cause mortality, so mortality from, from any causes. When we look at this, that same relationship, but we focus only on cardiovascular mortality, um, there are many, many, many studies that have also shown that extreme heat is associated with a greater risk of cardiovascular mortality. Uh, studies, and this this figure here is from a meta-analysis that was published in uh, recently, and th this is actually a really nice study where they combine studies looking at just a relationship between outdoor temperature and cardiovascular mortality, uh, but also uh, studies that look at specific extreme heat events, so for example, heat waves. And what they showed is that generally extreme heat is associated with a greater risk of cardiovascular mortality. And this is this occurs regardless of the of the type of cardiovascular mortality and um, and uh, demographics of the population or the or the areas that we live in. So I'll just walk through the graph for a second here. So we have the it's expressed as a relative risk. If the dots fall on the right side here, it means that there's a greater risk associated with hot temperatures. And if the dots were on the left, it would mean that there would be a lower risk of uh, mortality associated with hot weather. Now, the first thing we can see is all the dots fall roughly on, on the right side, so greater risk associated with hot weather. And this was true for overall cardiovascular mortality, but also when it was separated for different specific outcomes. So for example, hypertensive disease, coronary heart disease, acute coronary syndrome, heart failure, stroke, and others, including cardiac arrest. Um, it was true for males or females. Uh, it was true regardless of age, although this is a pretty rough age separation, so zero to 64, and, and, and as, uh, we can see that there's a greater risk in those aged above 65. And it also occurs regardless of the climate that we live in, so whether it's tropical to continental, and whether our, the country that we live in is a high income country or a lower middle income country. Although we can see that the risk seems progressively greater uh, towards the mid lower middle income countries, but also the estimates are very wide here, probably because there's just less data in general to inform. 
So the, the main point here to remember is that extreme heat is associated with a greater risk of cardiovascular mortality. And that seems to be true for most types of cardiovascular events and whether we are male or female, younger or older, and it, it seems to occur across the across the globe or uh, globally. So what we're interested in, in in our lab is trying to understand what could explain this association between extreme heat and cardiovascular mortality. And for that, we need to go back to some classic, classic studies that were done in the 1970s by Larry Rao. And this is one way to study heat exposure on the human body is to use what we call water perfused suits. Uh, it basically looks like a, a wetsuit that you would use for diving, but it has a plastic tube sewn into the material and is connected uh, to a water bath that we don't see here. And we could circulate hot water through this suit. And I always like to joke that this is very nice because the participants get very hot, but we're obviously very comfortable at, at room air temperature. But the main advantage of this is that it really allows us to do a bit more complicated or invasive measurements that maybe logistically we wouldn't be able to do in, a, if, for example, in a hot environment. So this is uh, one example here. And this model has been used extensively to study the, the human cardiovascular responses to heat stress. Um, so when we're in a, a neutral environment, most of our blood is located centrally. Uh, to keep the core warm around 37 degrees Celsius. And there's very little blood sent to the skin for heat exchange. Uh, the body basically doesn't need to send that much blood to the skin. It's not a very metabolically active organ. Um, so most of the blood is di distributed here within the core. And with this model, what we can do is we can start with a baseline period here. We can clamp the skin temperature at whatever value we want, but in this case, it was at 35 degrees Celsius, which is relatively neutral. And then by circulating hot water, it increases skin temperature, which can reach relatively high levels. So in this case, almost 40, 40.5 degrees Celsius. And obviously that's gonna drive heat into the body and eventually internal body temperature, which was uh, represented here by blood temperature will eventually increase. And it's a very controlled increase. Um, and usually within an hour to an hour and a half of heating, we can increase uh, core temperature by one to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And the first thing that will happen is obviously, like I mentioned, there'll be vasodilation of the, of the skin circulation. So now we're going to go from a situation where we have most of the blood distributed within the core to a redistribution of blood towards the periphery, so towards the skin circulation. Um, and that's really to try to facilitate heat exchange uh, between the body and the environment. And that causes a, a relatively important decrease in peripheral vascular resistance. And in order to maintain blood pressure, well, cardiac output has to increase. And these are data from young, healthy adults, 18 to 35 years old, roughly. And we can see that on average, in, in these studies at least, cardiac output was about six liters at rest. And during heating, it reached double that value, so 13 liters per minute at rest. Uh, I just want you to pause for a second and, and think about these numbers. So these are individuals that are just lying on a bed, doing nothing uh, except being hot, and their cardiac output can double. And 13 liters per minute is, is perhaps 50 to 60% of a maximal cardiac output that young healthy adults can reach during maximal exercise. So this is this is a really massive increase in, in cardiac output for just being at rest doing nothing. When we look at the components of cardiac output, well, and, and these data are specific for the supine posture, when, when heating is done in the supine, supine posture like this, stroke volume relatively stays constant. And if anything, it'll increase very slightly, but usually it stays relatively constant. Now, obviously, if, if, we, if we have vasodilation, a decrease in vascular resistance, resistance, a decreased venous return, but we're still able to maintain stroke volume, that really speaks to an increase in cardiac contractility to maintain stroke volume. And that's actually what's measured. So if we measured cardiac filling pressure, in this case, through a measurement of right atrial mean pressure, we can see that it decreases during heat stress. So the, the, the heart is able to maintain stroke volume in the face of a reduced cardiac filling pressure. And there's been some studies showing that um, this is really due to an increase in cardiac contractility. So that's the, that's the first thing to remember. And the second thing is also that although that stroke volume increases a little bit, 
this increase in cardiac output is really, really driven by an increase in heart rate, which can, uh, in some cases, double from resting values, at least in young, healthy adults. So this, these data have been shown in, in young adults. Uh, when I was uh, doing my postdoc, we, we, we replicated some of these findings in, in healthy older adults. And there's been, uh, especially Larry Kenny's uh, group, they've done a lot of work in healthy older adults as well. And if anything, these responses are a bit attenuated in healthy older adults. They'll have less of an increase in cardiac output, uh, less of an increase in heart rate. And I, I was always puzzled during my postdoc at least to say, okay, we know that there's an increase in cardiovascular demand, so there's an increase in the cardiovascular responses, but how do we take the next step and, and say, okay, well, how do these responses predispose individuals to, for example, a heart attack or cardiovascular mortality? So we started by just putting our ideas together and laying them out in a review article. And this is our working hypothesis for now. So we go from a neutral environment to a, a hot environment. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, on the heart, we have an increase in cardiac output, an increase in heart rate, and an increase in, in contractility. We're sweating, so we're reducing our, our blood volume if we don't um, replace our sweat losses with adequate fluid intake. Uh, we have cutaneous vasodilation, which is causing uh, a decrease in, in vascular resistance and, and venous return. And on top of that, we also have a hemal concentration, mostly if we get dehydrated and lose a lot of plasma volume. So if we take these physiological responses and, and we accept that there's an association between extreme heat and a, and a risk of adverse cardiovascular outcomes, what could be the mediating, mediating mechanisms underneath here that could explain this association? So as I mentioned, we have extreme heat. It decreases vascular resistance. It might decrease central blood volume uh, further if, if we're dehydrated. We know that that this causes a, a reflex increase in heart rate and also an increase in contractility, mostly to try and maintain uh, blood pressure. But also these responses are two of the main determinants of cardiac work, um, so of my myocardial oxygen consumption. So then we, we started thinking, okay, well, if the, if the heart is working harder, it's probably going to need a greater uh, oxygen consumption, so it's going to increase myocardial uh, oxygen consumption. And in order for the heart to increase its oxygen consumption, it needs to be fed by a greater supply of blood flow. And we know that, for example, with coronary artery disease, well, it's usually a, harm, uh, an, an, a reduced ability of the coronary arteries to vasodilate is one of the ha hallmarks of coronary artery disease. So maybe these individuals have less of, of an ability to um, bring blood towards uh, the heart, which we can represent through the coronary flow reserve. So the ability of the coronary vessels to vasodilate to increase blood flow to the heart. So if this is the case, so if the myocardial oxygen requirements uh, surpass the ability of the coronary arteries to supply um, the heart with blood, well, then maybe we could fall into a situation where there's not enough oxygen that's being delivered for the work that's being done. And that could predispose to myocardial ischemia. And we know that myocardial ischemia is a substrate for some of the adverse cardiovascular outcomes that are associated with extreme heat. So that was our, our, our first hypothesis. And this is the study that we did to try and, and answer this question. And I, I would just like to take a few slides to, to explain to you. So basically our question was, does heat exposure predispose to ischemia? And actually I would go one step before that. It was, does heat exposure increase myocardial blood flow? And is and if so, is, is this increase sufficient to actually make us think that it could predispose to myocardial ischemia? So what we did is we were extremely fortunate to, to uh, collaborate with the uh, nuclear imaging department at the Montreal Heart Institute. So they have two PET-CT um, scanners that they use um, for detection of uh, impaired coronary flow reserve in patients. Um, but they uh, nicely agreed for us to do uh, our studies on weeknights or weekends. Uh, so what we did is we used a water perfused suit model that I, I briefly described. And the, the model was relatively simple. So we started off people with a baseline period, and then we did one PET-CT scan, which is a nuclear imaging technique that allows us to measure myocardial blood flow. So we did this at baseline to get their resting uh, myocardial blood flow. And then we circulated hot water through the suit, 
And then we went until core temperature, which was measured uh, uh, rectally. Um, at each 0.5 increment in rectal temperature, we slided people back in the PET CT scanner to measure myocardial blood flow at each increase in core temperature here. So we had four measurements and it allowed, allowed us to determine, okay, does it increase with an increase in core temperature? Does it increase further with further increases in core temperature? And we also did this in three different groups. We did this in young, healthy adults, healthy, older adults, and also older adults with coronary artery disease. So the idea was to say, okay, well, if myocardial blood flow increases, is that increase affected by age? And is it further affected by the presence of coronary artery disease? So these were the, the characteristics of our, of our sample. So we had roughly 20 participants per group. So we have the young group, the healthy older group, and the older group with coronary artery disease. Obviously, there was a, an age difference. So the older groups are roughly 67 to 70 years old. Um, they were all relatively um, typical of, of those populations. So the young healthy participants were perfectly healthy. They didn't have any risk factors and obviously no uh, chronic diseases. The healthy older adults were also relatively healthy, except for uh, one adult uh, that had dyslipidemia. And the older adults with coronary artery disease, they were all optimally treated and their condition was uh, stable for at least three months prior to their participation in the study. And we can see that there was a varying proportion of individuals with, uh, and this is um, the number of participants, sorry, that had uh, dyslipidemia, dyslipidemia, hypertension, type two diabetes, and we can see that um, some uh, of these participants had a previous myocardial infarct infarction, a percutaneous intervention, or a coronary artery bypass graft. So I'll, I'll start off simply by just showing you the, the temperatures that we reached during our protocol. And I'll just take a, sen a second to orient you with the graphs here, because they'll be exactly the same for the subsequent slides. So we, here we have mean skin temperature, as a function of uh, the measurement time point, so either at baseline or prior to heat exposure, and then at, a, at an increase of 0.5, 1, and 1.5 degrees C in, uh, in uh, rectal temperature. We have the healthy young adults in the white bars, we have the healthy older adults in the gray bars, and we have the older adults with coronary artery disease in the, in the red bars. And these are box and whisker, splot, whisker plots, um, and the whiskers represent the 95% confidence intervals, and the little dots are the individual data. So obviously, as we might expect with our model, we increase skin temperature to roughly 38 to 39 degrees Celsius, and that caused a progressive increase in core temperature. And even though uh, the participant group started at a slightly different um, uh, values at the beginning, we all increased them 0.5, 1, and 1.5 degrees Celsius. And these are the absolute temperatures that were associated with the measurements. So by the end, we reached roughly 38 to 38.5 degrees Celsius internal body temperature, which we can consider uh, moderate hyperth hyperthermia. In terms of hemodynamics, um, on the left here, we have heart rate, and on the right, we have systolic blood pressure. Um, these two values are important because it's our way of indirectly calculating cardiac work as rate pressure product, which is the product of these two values. So we can see that in each group, heart rate increased. Um, we went from about 65 beats per minute at rest to almost 100, 105 beats per minute um, at the highest increase in core temperature uh, with slight differences between the groups, but that were not statistically different. Um, I didn't specify, but these hashtags here are really whether this uh, increase is different from the previous one. And uh, this little asterisk here is just to say that this group was different from the young healthy group. So overall, we can see that it increases with heat exposure, but there's few between group differences. For blood pressure, the older groups, as we might expect, started a, a slightly higher level of systolic blood pressure. And we can see that it remains relatively stable uh, throughout heat exposure with a, a bit of a tendency, although variable in, the, in especially the older group with coronary artery disease to slightly increase their systolic blood pressure during heat exposure. So we have a situation where heart rate is increasing, systolic blood pressure, if anything, is staying relatively, uh, uh, relatively stable. So when we do the product of these two values and to calculate rate pressure product, which is an, an indirect assessment of cardiac work, 
well, it's obviously increasing, and this is due to the increase in heart rate. So if cardiac work is increasing, we can expect that myocardial blood flow will also increase, and this is what we observed. So we the value started at roughly 0.8 milliliters per minute per grams of, uh, of heart tissue, and in each group, myocardial blood flow increased, uh, although we can see that there's relatively big variability um, or inter-individual variability, but the general trend is there. By the end, myocardial blood flow was roughly 1.5 to 1.4 to 1.5 mLs per minute per grams. Um, now, this is, at least to me at first, these numbers didn't really tell me anything. I don't know what is a normal myocardial blood flow and, and whether this is a, an important or a small increase. So one way to quantify this, at least in the clinic, is to look at the full change. So how much does myocardial blood flow increase relative to baseline values? So this is the table here. So at a 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in core temperature, in the young group it doubled, so a two-fold increase. In the healthy older group, it was approximately a 1.8-fold increase. And in the older group with coronary artery disease, it was approximately a 1.6-fold increase. Now, in the clinic, the, the PET-CT scanners are used to determine uh, coronary flow of reserve, so the ability of the coronary arteries to, to, to dilate. And they look at this value, so the full change in myocardial blood flow, in response to a pharmacological stimulation, which is thought to essentially uh, cause maximal myocardial blood flow. So this is the this is the column that I'm showing here, and these are data that I took from the literature, so we didn't actually measure this in the participants. But in the literature, a maximal change in myocardial blood flow for young or older healthy individuals is approximately three to four-fold, although there's a very wide range, so it could go from one to eight. So if we accept that it's roughly three to four-fold, well, the change that we saw here, that represents approximately 50 to 66% of maximal myocardial blood flow. So at least to me, it suggests that it's, it's not a trivial increase. It's a, it's, a, it's a pretty good increase. And then for the adults with coronary artery disease, like I said, a hallmark of, of uh, this disease is a reduced ability of the coronary arteries to dilate. So when the maximal pharmacological tests are done in the clinic, um, for these patients, the increase is approximately 1.6 fold, and it can range from roughly 1.2 to 2.4. So potentially the, the 1.6 fold increase that we see on average here, that could present that could represent at least 67% of the maximal myocardial blood flow that these individuals can attain. And in some individuals, it could surpass their maximal myocardial blood flow. So if that's the case, maybe we could expect that some individuals would show signs of myocardial ischemia. And this was the case in, in our sample. And we, after each uh, visit, we, the, um, the car we had a cardiologist collaborating with us. So he was, he's the head of nuclear imaging at the Montreal Heart Institute. So he reviewed all the PET-CT images to look for the presence of, of, of heat-induced ischemia. So we observed ischemia in seven of the adults with coronary artery disease. So that was approximately 35% of our sample. So one in three individuals. And what was really surprising or yeah, surprising is that this ischemia occurred at relatively mild increases in, in core temperature for some individuals. So there were three participants. Ischemia was already observed at only an increase in, in core temperature of 0.5 degrees Celsius. Two, it occurred at, at an increase in one degree Celsius and an additional two participants had an increase in 1.5 degrees Celsius. In terms of sever severity, the severity of ischemia was mild for three participants, moderate for, for three participants as well, and severe for one participant. And for three of the seven participants, the severity of ischemia worsened with further increases in core temperature. And I'm just going to show you the, uh, the, the data from, from, from one of the participants, and this would be the, the participant with severe ischemia. So these are our perfusion maps. Um, essentially, it, it's looking at the heart that we get with the image with the PET-CT scanner, and then it has a color scheme. So if my, myocardial blood flow is zero, it'll be black. And if it's uh, approaching three milliliters per minute per grams, it'll be yellow. And we have the, the map at baseline at, at an increase in core temperature of 0.5, 1, and 1.5 degrees Celsius. And you have the absolute values here at the bottom. 
So this individual was able to increase myocardial blood flow with heat exposure. So it went from 0.72 to 0.95. But what was really striking is that um, there was a redistribution of myocardial blood flow to, to support the, the increase that was needed during heat exposure. So we can see that there's a mild, uh, there's a perfusion defect. So there's not enough perfusion even at baseline in this area here. And you can see that it gets progressively worse with the increases in temperature or progressively darker. And um, this is, uh, obviously I'm not a cardiologist, but what I was told is this is the definition of a coronary steal. So it's essentially taking blood away from one area of the heart to send it elsewhere so that the heart can do the work that's needed, in this case, during heat exposure. So if we go back to our working hypothesis, um, I think that these data, at least to me, confirm that there is a possibility of myocardial ischemia during heat exposure. And maybe for some individuals, this could underlie the association between extreme heat and an adverse risk of cardiovascular outcomes. But obviously that's not the only mechanism that could, pre that could explain this association. Uh, most cardiovascular events are really triggered by inflammation and, and thrombosis um, that cause an acute coronary event, for example. And there's, there's one study that was done in, in the 1980s, if I remember, that suggests that heat exposure, at least in young healthy adults, uh, can predispose to inflammation and a, and a, and a, and a hemostatic environment that, that would favor coagulation and predispose to thrombosis. But this hasn't really been looked at in older adults and especially older adults with heart disease. Um, this for sure happens in the context of heat stroke but we still don't know if it's really realistic to think that this might occur during environmental heat exposure uh, that would result in milder uh, thermal strain, so core temperatures that are not even close to heat stroke. So this is our next line of inquiry um, that we're gonna start within uh, hopefully soon and hopefully provide some, some answers on that possibility as well. So with that, I'll stop here. I I'll, I'll wanted to leave a lot of time for questions, so I'd just like to thank you for your attention. And again, thanks for the uh, invitation to present today. Thank you very much. This was really, really interesting. Also, really nice slides. Um, I, uh, I uh, really enjoyed watching them. Um, so now we have again some time for questions. Maybe I'll start and give people time to put them in the chat. Ah, oh, no, we already have one. Being very fast. So the first question is, um, why may a steal of blood within the heart lead to a cardiovascular event? Yeah, so the, that's a good question. It's not so much the steal within the heart that would, uh, that would cause the event, it's really the ischemia itself. So obviously that region, if, if it's getting less and less blood, well, that region is still metabolically active. So it's probably not getting sufficient blood for its, uh, for its uh, oxygen requirements. And if that is prolonged, well, that can lead to things like uh, a myocardial infarct. Um, it can also trigger arrhythmias, and those are the events that would then be picked up in the, uh, that would lead people to go to the hospital, and that would be picked up in the epidemiological studies. So that, so I, I think the, the steel itself, obviously it's the initiating process that would lead towards the event, but it's not the event in itself. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I have a question myself. Uh, in the beginning, you talked about the death rate uh, with the temperature. And there we saw that with increasing heat, the death rate increased, but that temperature varied by country. And I was wondering if you have an idea, is it genetics? Is it acclimation? Is it behavior? Or maybe also um, the healthcare, since you saw some differences between low income countries later on? Yeah, so those are all possibilities. Um, obviously, the there's probably some element of acclimation. So if we live in a country where it's always hot, probably we develop some tolerance to the heat. Um, maybe the some it could be some places where the infrastructure is different, um, and it could also be just uh, socioeconomic conditions as well. So if you have wide or large um, groups of populations that are disadvantage and that have heat exposure don't have the means to adapt to it or to stay cool that could also explain that that shifting risk but in general yes for sure when in the hotter countries that that threshold temperature is usually towards uh, hotter temperatures 
I think the main thing to remember is that even if we live in a hot country, when it becomes extreme for our climate, it still is associated with greater health risks. OK, interesting. And then a question from the end audience. So you did your uh, testing in a, in a supine position, I think, in the MRI. Um, would you expect more ischemia in the upright position, and especially if you would do a physical activity? Uh, I guess p uh, potentially, because obviously in the supine position, it's almost the optimal scenario for the heart. Um, it favors re venous return. It, it Stroke volume is relatively maintained. So heart rate still has to increase, but it, it doesn't have to increase as much uh, relative to if we were in the upright posture. So it probably would make things worse. Uh, obviously, if we add physical activity on top of that, that'll add the it'll add to the cardiac work that occurs just with heat exposure already. So to add the cardiac work that's associated with exercise, I don't know if it would work, lead to a greater degree or if it would just occur sooner. So obviously, in the in the supine posture, I mean, our first measurements were at an increase in 0.5. Does it occur earlier? I mean, maybe, but we don't know. But maybe for somebody that it occurs at an increase in one degree Celsius in the supine resting posture, if that individual would do the same thing in the upright posture with or without exercise, maybe we, we would expect that that ischemia would occur sooner. So I don't know, at a lower increase in core temperature. So I guess the, yeah, if anything that would increase cardiac work technically could predispose to um, sooner ischemia. Okay, thank you. And then I was wondering a bit about the practical setting of uh, the methods that you described, because then you have the patients that have to go into the scanner. How do you manage to get them to a certain temperature in that room? Because usually, if I'm correct, those rooms are not too big. Uh, so the with the scanner one, uh, the room is actually a decent size, but the, the scanner itself is tight. Um, so they're just lying on a bed. Um, and we can move the bed back and forth um, from inside to outside of the scanner. So it actually worked well for the protocol, not to say that it was very comfortable. So obviously they're lying there for maybe an hour at a time. So by the end, they were definitely happy to get off that bed. It's not the it's meant for a relatively quick examination. Um, so it's not comfortable, but it practically it was doable. But it was, it was only doable with the suits because it's portable and we, we could move the bed in and out of the scanner uh, while the people kept getting hot. So that, that's really the only way that we could do it. And then I have a question about the suit because I've, if I understood correctly, their head is just free. Mm -hmm. Do you think it makes a big difference that the head is not in a hot environment? Yeah, it, I think it makes a big difference for the perception. So if we've actually done uh, some studies in the past where we also had like a, a a hoodie that we can put on top of the head that's also perfused with hot water, and that makes the sensation much, much worse. Um, in terms of the physiological responses, we're already covering most of the body surface. So it wouldn't, for example, heat up people faster and it probably wouldn't make the, the cardiovascular responses any different but the perception is worse because our head is hot. Um, so at least it, not to say that it's comfortable, but it's relatively better if we don't have the, the hoodie on relative to if we wear it. More tolerable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. I myself don't support the heat too well, so <laughs> I think it would be nice to not have your head in the, in the suit. Absolutely. Um, then maybe a very different question. Because here in Paris, it's and especially at INSEP, it's all about the Olympics right now. And with climate change, we can expect to have some extremely hot dates during the competition. Most athletes, I imagine, they will be prepared. But would you have advice for the audience or for the staff, the people working in the stadiums and such? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a, it's a good point because obviously we... First and foremost, we think of the athletes because they're outside, they're exercising at relatively high intensities. So, so we need to make sure that they're going to stay safe. But also the audience, which could be the general population with different health profiles. And just sitting there, for example, if it's in direct sunlight, I mean, it can get pretty hot pretty fast, especially for a prolonged period of time. So I think it's to be cognizant that, you know, if it's hot outside, 
we need to know that there are some particular risks that can be associated with it. We, we need to try and minimize these risks by uh, minimizing our degree of exposure to heat. Obviously, like I said, our main uh, mechanism to lose heat is sweating. So if we're going to, if we're, if we're sweating and we're going to sweat uh, during heat exposure, we need to pay attention to fluid intake. And obviously, participants are in this seated upright posture and not doing anything. So from from a cardiovascular perspective, I mean, that's going to cause a little bit more strain on the heart. And it's been shown that our ability to maintain blood pressure when we're hot, uh, and especially in the upright seated position, or or if people are standing up, I mean, maybe people could start feeling dizzy and there could be some, there, there's a potential risk of syncope. I think the key is to listen to our body and, and obviously, you know, get out, get ourselves out of that situation before it's too late. So as soon as we start feeling uncomfortable, we need to find a place to just rest and get out of the heat and and drink some water and, and stay cool. So, I mean, I, I'm sure this is already planned, but I'm sure the organizing committee has, you know, rest uh, stations where people can, you know, get out of the heat if it's very hot. And obviously, I, I'm assuming the competitions might also be adjusted if it's extremely hot outside. Yeah, that's very useful advice. I have some questions coming in from the chat. Um, someone is wondering if heat therapy is not a good option for this population, the CAD patients. Yeah, it's a good question. Heat therapy is obviously very different. We, uh, you know, we did heat exposure where we increased core temperature a lot. Um, people were a lot, 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, their skin temperatures are very high. And they're also exposed to the heat for roughly an hour, I would say. Um, if I remember correctly, I mean, obviously, the people who demonstrated ischemia, I think they were known for having residual ischemia uh, previously. So maybe that's one population to keep an eye on if we want to apply heat therapy. Uh, but we can obviously adjust the dose, so we don't need to go as hot. Uh, we don't need to have skin temperatures as high. We don't, we don't need to go as long. Um, we've done one study with Finnish saunas. Um, we did not see any adverse events uh, in in uh, 20 participants over an eight-week period, and they were doing up to four saunas uh, per week. But they were going in the sauna for two times 15 minutes with a cold shower in between. So, so I think it's it's just a question of adjusting the the dose. And obviously, if some people have a pre-existing uh, health condition is just making sure that we identify it and, and decide if we need to adjust what we're going to do with with those individuals before we start. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Another question from the chat. What could be the associated heat induced ischemia pathological issues? Uh, yeah, so so the, um, the, the main thing, at least from my understanding, is that uh, myocardial ischemia, obviously in this case it's reversible. So when we stop the heating, um the, the, the ischemia goes away so it's really an ischemia that's due that that manifests itself because of an increase in cardiac work um so there's not necessarily an immediate risk and obviously we didn't see uh, anything that would suggest that that these people were at immediate risk for their health it's more if it's prolonged so and i i don't have an exact uh, threshold for this but if somebody has ischemia for a long period of time well, obviously that could lead to uh, insufficient oxygen in some areas of the heart, so it could lead to a myocardial infarction. And also before that, it could also be predisposed to ventricular arrhythmias, um, which which those would be the pathological issues that then um, would would make people end up in the hospital and that would need to be treated. And I think the, the bigger point too is that obviously all of our participants were well treated optimally treated their condition was stable they all we all knew that they had heart disease um, but we can think that for example if it's very hot outside for a few days the entire population is exposed to that heat if we have individuals who are not optimally treated or they don't even know that they have heart disease well maybe the increase in cardiac work could predispose to a, a first event that and they would discover essentially that they have a, a heart condition so so I think it's, yeah, again, the ischemia is not in itself the problem, but it's what's going to predispose to potential issues um, that then get picked up in the epidemiolo epidemiological studies that do the association between heat and, and cardiovascular outcomes. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, another question on the graph that you showed about the blood pressure values. We saw some questioning values on uh, systolic blood pressure in some older individuals. 
at um, the one and a half degree increase uh, dropped to lower than 75 millimeters or an increase above 180. Was that associated to some adverse event, uh, painting or? I can uh, I'll put the graph back up here. Yeah, so the um, so indeed, so we did see some uh, some relatively high values and one very low value for blood pressure. Um, we did not have any adverse events in in this sample, so nobody fainted, nobody complained of, for example, chest pain, uh, lightheadedness, um, nothing like that. So even though these these we observed these these values, they weren't associated with any clinical manifestation that suggested that it was. Uh, potentially dangerous for those individuals. I think obviously for the low end, uh, 75 is getting towards the end, uh, the lower end that we would like to tolerate. Um, but this, I, I remember this was the last value and after that we, we stopped the heating anyways. So um, blood pressure came back up afterwards. What helps, if I can put it that way, is obviously people are in the supine posture. So, and we see, we see this even in not this necessarily these populations, but we see it in, in some populations, but it's well tolerated because people are lying down and, and there's sufficient venous return. Uh, so people can quote unquote tolerate relatively low systolic blood pressures even uh, even during heat exposure. And the higher ones, and I don't have the connecting lines here, but I, I would suspect that that individual is always the same individual that's at the higher end of the blood pressure responses. And we do see that in some individuals, although this was the first time at least for me, that we studied people with uh, coronary artery disease. And sometimes we see in the he healthy groups that it can systolic blood pressure can increase maybe 10, 15 millimeters of mercury. Um, but we did see what's what appears to be a more exaggerated response in the in the in the adults with coronary artery disease. Now, is this something related to this specific group, this specific pathology? Um, some of them already had hypertension. Is it related to their medication, et cetera, et cetera? I don't, I don't really know. So it was a bit unex unexpected, but it was not associated with any uh, with any symptoms of of uh, hypotension or or even a high blood pressure, headaches, and things like that. We nobody reported that, anyways. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So I don't see any further questions from the chat then I think we were very, very lucky to have two excellent talks, two high quality presentations on two very interesting, fascinating, but also relevant topics. So I'm very, very happy and I can only thank you, um, Daniel Middle and also uh, Samuel for these presentations. And I also would like to thank the audience for being present and asking uh, very interesting questions as well. So uh, thank you very much. And then I'll know uh, if there are no further questions coming in, I'll uh, end this webinar. Thank you. Thank you.